advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ICANN 70, Insights from the Virtual Meeting. My name is Tariq Hopkins, and I'll be your moderator. Joining us today is Gretchen Olive. Gretchen is Director of Policy and Global Domain Name Services for CSC. For nearly two decades, Gretchen has helped Global 2000 companies devise global domain name, trademark, and online brand protection strategies, and is a leading authority for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers new GTLD program. And with that, let's welcome Gretchen. Thanks, Tarek. Yes, we always with an ICANN meeting have a busy agenda, and this, this session will be no um, exception. So we'll cover our usual ICANN overview. We always have a few new people who join us, so I always like to make sure everybody understands kind of how ICANN works. We'll dive into DNS abuse. We'll go through some key policy development process updates. We'll talk a little bit more about the GAC. And then we'll also talk about new GTLD round two and where, when that might be happening. So in terms of um, ICANN meetings, as we've spoken about before, um, there's generally three public meetings that happen every year. Um, the first one of the year, which this is um, typically in the March time frame, this is typically a six-day format. Um, because we're we're still kind of all virtual at this point. Um, you know, ICANN meetings are not happening in person, they're virtual. Um, this was more of a four-day four day format. They did have some pre-meetings before, the week before, um, so it was a little bit different, but this is the meeting really um, known as the community forum, and this is very similar to kind of like the ICANN meetings that have happened in the past. It's kind of a, I would call it a, a smattering of everything, some work group meetings, some high interest topics, um, a lot of um, discussion around kind of what the what we're trying to you know get done. All right, so now that we know what meeting we're in, now let's talk a little bit about ICANN as an organization, or really what it kind of means to be the ICANN community. So, ICANN the you know organization is kind of made up of staff, a, you know, president, CEO. They also report to a board of directors. Um, there's an ombudsman. That's a little bit unusual. Most corporations don't have that. But then you have all these kind of blue and gray boxes below the kind of um, blue bar at the top. And these are different supporting organizations and advisory committees where the policy work really happens. Um, it's the blue boxes really where you know, the policy work starts. Um, ICANN is a multi-stakeholder model. Um, it is a consensus policy-driven organization. It comes from the bottom up and kind of bubbles up to the board of directors. And as that kind of unfolds, you have these kind of gray boxes to the right-hand side that are advisory committees. They're really tasked with advising the board, but more and more we're seeing them kind of provide inputs as the policy process is starting at sort of this kind of grassroots level. So you have the IETF there at the top. Um, you also have the Security and Stability um, Advisory Council there in the middle. You also have the Root Server System Advisory Committee. And, and then kind of last but not least is the Governmental Advisory Committee, or the GAC, and we'll talk a fair amount about them as well um, this session. All right, so one of the kind of the largest topic of ICANN 70 was DNS abuse, and we've seen this now the last, you know, three to five meetings where DNS abuse is really the hot topic of, of the meeting. And it is continues to be, quite honestly, um, you know, DNS abuse is a chronic and growing problem. Uh, you know, outside events, you know, things like COVID, like natural disasters, like civil unrest, they really kind of amp things up. Um, when it comes to DNS abuse, people, the bad guys, the bad actors out there kind of see an opportunity in those kind of events. The common theme, though, is that, you know, the DNS, the domain name system, is leveraged for illicit purposes. And it's cheap, it's easy, it's anonymous, and, you know, it's kind of like the perfect storm 
um, you know, when it comes to kind of bad guys. This is they they love this this kind of low cost, low effort, big harm, big impact um, kind of model. You know, there's lots of studies out there, but you know, one study says it's estimated, you know, in this year alone, uh, cybercrime will cost the global economy more than six trillion dollars and. You know, that's only going to multiply, quite honestly. I've seen a bunch of estimates through, like, 2025, and it it just continues to double, triple, quadruple. Um, it is, you know, the, the DNS is a globally scalable um, infrastructure, and it really helps, um, you know, these types of activities have a big impact at wide scale. So, you know, the big challenge here is that governments, I can and the I can community, businesses, consumers, just internet users. Most of us, in all, in, in, in all honesty, are truly unprepared and really not adequately dealing with these threats. These these bad guys are a step ahead, and this is really the essence of the conversation that's going on: is trying to figure out, you know, what is ICANN's role in this um, as a you know a, a governor, if you will of the domain name system. So I guess, you know, that leads us to the question of what is being done. And, you know, right now it's a very much a patchwork approach um, within ICANN, the ICANN community. Uh, you know, I think it's always been, you know, ICANN has always struggled with, um, you know, kind of, where the where to draw draw the line and in a lot of ways I think the organization itself has tried to clearly state like you know they are really just the administrator of the technical identifiers right they are um, not responsible for content um, they've said that over and over and over again but this DNS abuse issue it, it's just sort of it collides everything that's been said and leaves I, I think a pretty big gray area and. So there's a lot of questions around ICANN's remit. You know, what about compliance? Isn't, a compl isn't ICANN compliance a tool that can help us, you know, improve DNS abuse or mitigate DNS abuse? What about the kind of the adequacy and the availability of the tools that ICANN has? For an organization that is the, you know, governor of uh, the domain name system, they often don't seem to have the sort of the cutting edge tools necessary to really have the insights um, that one would expect. Um, there's also coordination that's required between industry players and, you know, registries and registrars are contracted parties with ICANN. And so there's always this sort of like contractual framework between the parties, but the coordination piece isn't always um, doesn't always go great, quite honestly. It's because there's this contractual relationship and, you know, each side wanting to be careful of liability and rights and responsibilities and things like that. So, you know, combine that sort of grayness, if you will, with just overall awareness and understanding of DNS abuse not being particularly high. I think, you know, there's a certainly, you know, a lot of people who know about online fraud and phishing and, you know, counterfeiting and all these other things that happen online. But when you cr look across the globe at large, um, there's a very large population that does not have a real awareness of this. Um, most feel that ICANN, the contracted parties, need to do more um, and, you know, want to see them do more. Um, we also want, you know, specifically more tools to identify and uh, to validate the abuse as well as education and accountability. So, you know, while all this has been kind of talked about, like I said, over the, you know, with pretty good intensity over the last three to five ICANN meetings, you know, it's kind of gone in circles. There's, there hasn't been, I would say, any concrete, like, this is what we can do to make things better um, or this is what we should do, this is what we should work towards to make things better. And in the background, there's been um, one of the advisory committees I mentioned on that sort of organizational slide, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, has been working on a report, you know, not just for DNS abuse, but this is they, they put these reports together. This will be their second big report. Um, it's Security and Stability and Resiliency Report. Um, They've been working on that, and as part of that um, re 
report, there's been kind of high anticipation that this technical group could provide some kind of insights and some recommendations for, you know, real concrete um, recommendations for what could be next. What should the ICANN community be working on? What should ICANN, the organization, be working on? What is that roadmap for the path forward? So that's been pretty highly anticipated over the last, you know, I would say four to six months. So in the ICANN world, we love our acronyms, so there should be no reason why we shouldn't have a really good set of acronyms for um, this report. So it's called the SAC, SSR2 report. <laughs> so Security Stability Advisory Committee, Security Stability Resiliency 2 report. Um, so that's uh, you know acronyms for, for the day. But basically this report was delivered to the ICANN board at the end of um, January, and it contains actually 63 recommendations. It's kind of grouped into a bunch of buckets. Like I said, this report wasn't completely, you know, solely about DNS abuse. It's about some other, other kind of insights and um, kind of reviews done by, by the SAC. Um, but so basically they, they looked at the first report, um, SSR1, um, implementation and kind of um, what were the intended effects um, and, and looked at that. Then they looked at key stability issues within ICANN. Um, they looked at con contracts, compliance, and transparency around DNS abuse and also looked at additional security stability and resiliency, that's that SSR, related concerns regarding the global DNS. So. The public comment on this um, runs until April 8th, and I provide the link here where you can see the report and the comments. Um, once the, the advisory committee issued the report, which was the end of January, then the board has six months to, re to basically from receipt of the report to kind of review and consider the recommendations and kind of either accept them or reject them. Um, they could also obviously ask questions as well. So really by the end of July, um, the ICANN board should respond to this report. So for any recommendations they approve, um, the board is expected to kind of direct implementation, direct the ICANN organization um, to, you know, work through implementation of the, re of the recommendations that they approve. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to start you know, implementing and working on implementation like right then and there. Um, it's subject to planning, scheduling, and prioritization. So basically all the competing priorities that I can, the organization is working on, this will then get sort of filled into that set of priorities and, and, and you know, kind of put in the right ranking, if you will. Then if any, if the recommendations of the board, um, any of those recommendations the board does not approve, the board is required to provide a written rationale for such action. And typically when that happens, there's some subsequent discussion and potentially, um, you know, kind of wrangling over that. So we'll, we'll watch this carefully. But, um, you know, this report definitely was sort of like chock, chock full of things um, that, uh, you know, really can potentially help and help us um, as, as a community kind of get to, I would say, better mechanisms to deal with DNS abuse. I don't think the report is intended or will have the effect of, like, you know, totally mitigating DNS abuse, but um, I think there are some really good recommendations in this report. So let's go through some of the key SSR2 recommendations. Um, obviously, can't go through all 63 of them, but let's go through what I think are some of the, the key ones. One is ICANN should commission a negotiating team um, that looks, that basically includes abuse and security experts, um, not affiliated with any of the contracted parties, and work to renegotiate the contracts um, to make sure that the security, stability, and resiliency of the DNS for end users, businesses, and governments is improved. So let's kind of break that down just a little bit, is that, you know, what, what's often challenging in, in the ICANN world, like I mentioned before, is that, you know, ICANN, the registries, the registrars, they're all contracted parties. And so there's sort of this kind of, you know, I would call sort of arm's length dealing, yes, um, but it's 
a very kind of closed group. It's a you know these these everybody kind of knows each other. Um, you know, look, CSC is a registrar. We're one of these parties, but we're very different than many other registrars. And, and in fact, you know, over over like three thousand registrars around the world, we're like you know one of a very small small handful of registrars that just works with you know corporations and their law firms. Most registrars are you know dealing with the, the general public, small organizations really operate a self-service business where you can go onto their platform, you can set up an account and, you know, you put a credit card in and off you go. There, there's, there's, so there's a very, it's a very closed group, if you will, that are always kind of working on these issues. And the thought of, you know, kind of objective third parties that don't have kind of, uh, you know, a, a stake in, in everything and working through looking at the contracts and negotiating the contracts. You know, everybody, every registry signs effectively close to the same contract. Registrars all sign sign the same contract with ICANN. But having someone kind of from the outside maybe handle this and look at what should be the provisions that are in that, those contracts to improve the situation, um, I, I think is a really interesting idea. I suspect there's going to be some resistance to that, but I think that is a really um, a, a good idea. Um, and another recommendation in terms of things that ICANN should do, it should strictly enforce the security, stability, and resiliency obligations, monitor and enforce registration data accuracy, and the external audit should be conducted against ICANN Compliance. I mean, ICANN Compliance conducts audits on registries and registrars, as they should, no problem. But one of the questions is, is okay, so how is ICANN Compliance doing? Um, you know, I think there's some additional tools there, and I, that's definitely one of the recommendations the SAC had. Because, again, it's there are over 3,000 accredited registrars around the globe. Now, some of them are kind of related to the same family of, of registrars, so it's not truly 3,000 individual players. But, you know, I think there's some, some additional accountability and transparency that's needed here, and I think this could really get to some of that. Um, another recommendation is to provide clarity on definitions on, of DNS abuse-related terms and then identifying which abuse categories I can seize within or out within or outside of its remit. Again, this is kind of that gray area I talked about. There's, there's, you know, this. You know, it's not our job. We don't want to cross the line. We're not responsible for content. And I'm not saying that you know I can has any kind of bad intent here. I I think that's been their position, you know, all along. But the question is, is that as the kind of governor of the the domain name space, the identifiers, like there has to be a role here for them to play. You know, maybe it's more of compliance and enforcement, but there needs to be more. There needs to be more tools. There needs to be kind of um, more clarity brought to this exactly what they are responsible for and what their obligations should be, and not necessarily just being self-defined. Um, there's also a recommendation to overhaul um, DNS abuse analysis and reporting. Um, again, looking for greater transparency, independent review, um, more reporting, so that there can be clarity as to where the bad guys uh, are and who they're working with within the domain ecosystem. And, you know, looking at you know, what are different registries and, you know, reports of what different registries and registrars are doing in response to these complaints of illegal or malicious conduct um, in using the DNS the way they are. So, you know, it is well known that there are some registrars out there that either harbor bad actors, you know, like they really enable them, um, and there's some registrar, you know, registrars and registries that, you know, they are – they're like right up against the line and they kind of, you know, don't do everything that they could be doing to mitigate this abuse. And so, again, you know, kind of having reporting around that and understanding who's doing what I think could be a really good um, path forward. Um, 
Another recommendation is to basically increase the transparency and accountability around the abuse complaint reporting. Um, you know what? You know who? How many how many reports are being made? What's being done with those complaints? How successful is I can in resolving those issues, or do they just kind of like, sorry, not our job? Find you know, go talk to somebody else. Um, there needs to be more granularity. There needs to be um, more, you know, transparency and accountability here. And I, I, I completely agree that that would um, be something that, you know, should be not just kind of given lip service, but actually some work and implementation of, you know, mechanisms that would lead to that. And just to kind of round out some of the key recommendations, um, you know, another recommendation is that ICANN should create kind of a temporary specification for evidence-based security improvements. So this would really require, you know, kind of like thresholds, like in order to, 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 to continue to be a registrar or registry in good standing, that you would have to maintain um, abusive domains under management below a certain threshold, and it would really require ICANN to provide a list of these domains um, in each contracted party's portfolio, as, you know, and tag them as abusive. Um, notices to contracted parties when they exceed the thresholds, and also, you know, consider in fi financial incentives for being a good actor. Um, you know, that tends to really work in terms of. Um, encouraging certain behavior is that a financial incentive. So, um, you know, maybe reduce costs or, or something like that can can be something that I can can look at for registrars who are you know doing all the right things or the registries that are doing all the right things. So, um, I I think this could be a very effective recommendation and something that really um, should be fleshed out. Um, and then lastly is um, to launch, similar to what we've done on um, who is in light of the, the general data protection regulation where there was an EPDP, an expedited policy development process launched to try to figure out what to do um, with the conflict between, you know, ICANN who is policy and the general data protection regulation. While the EPDP hasn't gone as expedited <laughs> as everybody, I think, thought it would, um, it, I, I think, you know, an in, in EPDP on anti-abuse, um, kind of defining the countermeasures and remediation and the different types of abuse, I think definitely some very focused um, kind of intense work schedule on this topic is really needed. The, the challenge is, is we're behind. Um, the, the, the community is behind on this, and so it's really important to kind of, you know, ramp up the activity, ramp up the policy work, ramp up, you know, trying to get to, you know, defined mechanisms and tactics and kind of different mechanisms that can be put in place to at least, you know, better address. Again, I don't think that these things are going to um, magically make everything better, but I think it can help. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, unfortunate, but the, the truth of the matter is there's no quick answers here, and it's going to take everybody's vigilance. And, you know, and I really, really encourage, you know, our, our clients here on, online with us here tonight, like, you need to be vigilant in protecting um, your company and, and, your, and your customers. Um, there is no silver bullet here. I know many people's, um, you know, security groups, they are doing amazing work, really trying to batten down the hatches and really try to protect the organization. A lot of times those efforts are very, very focused on things that are, you know, inside the firewall. And it's really unfortunate in some ways that this domain system really sits outside the firewall and there's, you know, there's kind of limited um, I would say insight that a lot of companies can see it, you know, things coming at them. Um, but, you know, that's really why you hear us at CSC really talk about a defense in depth approach is because there is no one single silver bullet 
to kind of protect your domain portfolio, your other digital assets like, you know, DNS and SSL, all these things that kind of operate your business, um, there's no kind of silver bullet. You really need to just keep on wrapping multiple layers of security, you know, what your security team is doing inside the firewall as well as things you can be doing outside the firewall like registry lock and DNSSEC, um, you know, CAA records, um, all sorts of things that, you know, we, we offer our clients to make sure that they are doing everything possible to keep things, you know, locked and protected and, you know, all eyes on those assets because the second you take your eye off of it, the second you think you have it all covered, um, you know, that's when disaster seems to strike and no one wants to be a headline, you know, in the New York Times. So, um, you know, ICANN's going to do its work here. I, I'm, you know, would love to see it really ramp up, um, but there are no quick answers here, so we, we all need to really be vigilant. All right. Well, let's turn now to um, where we are on some very important policy development processes uh, going on at ICANN. So probably the one that we've been talking the most about over the last couple of years has been the EPDP, or the Expedited Policy Development Process, um, related to the who is. And I, as I mentioned earlier, this was actually something I can, um, this EPDP was something that I can launch as a result of sort of the conflict between the I can who is rules and the general data protection regulation. Um, that was enacted, uh, sorry, enfor started to be enforced in um, May of 2018. And gosh, it seems like uh, <laughs> yesterday in some ways. But the CPDP was the first um, expedited policy development process that ICANN had attempted in its kind of short, uh, you know, uh, existence. But nonetheless, it was in response to the general data protection um, regulation, which was really trying to... Um, harmonize data privacy laws across Europe and kind of um, protect and empower kind of um, EU citizens' data privacy. And what's unique about the GDPR is it's sort of, um, not sort of, it is um, what they call extraterritorial. So it, it applies outside um, of the, the EU countries. And so if you're a company that's working with a European citizen, you know, the GDPR is something that you need to pay attention to because there are fines for noncompliance that are very, very substantial. So, you know, ICANN, for as long as I have been involved in ICANN, which has been 20 years, which completely blows my mind every time I say that, um, we've been talking about who is and the problems with who is. And this finally made, you know, in the past ICANN kind of just existed as if, as if their who is policy was the only thing in the world that mattered. But they had to recognize with the, G, the, the kind of enforceability of the GDPR that their who is policy was not the real law of the land. Um, and so they had to launch this expedited policy development process to try to kind of reconcile these things. And um, so they issued the temporary specification that kind of made it okay for who is to get redacted um, to, to a large extent um, so that they could work through policy development on, you know, not only like what data elements should appear in a who is record, but also how access should be granted to that record. Because really up until that point, you know, who is was free and public and, you know, every uh, every registrar had to provide, uh, you know, a who is service um, to be able to allow people to look up kind of uh, who is the licensee of a domain name. So it really turned things um, on its head. So the EPDP was broken initially into two phases. Phase one was about that collection and handling of the who is contact data what were the data elements, et cetera. And then phase two is about access to the who is data by registries, registrars, I can, other third parties like security investigators, IP um, holders, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the initial report was issued within the year time frame. It was um, issued in February 2019. A implementation review team was um, kind of formulated 
to kind of look at those recommendations and to kind of make them, you know, work through the implementation. Um, this this has now um, continued on. Um, I think a lot of people expected that kind of within a year of that report that there would be implementation. Um, that didn't happen. I think some would say, you know, maybe COVID got in the way a little bit, but quite honestly, that work, you know, that group is still working, and and you'll hear a little later about how there are different parties within the ICANN community that are really calling for them to kind of issue some kind of like defined timetable and milestones that they're going to reach. So we all know when this work is going to get done. Um, it's not easy work. Don't don't get me wrong, um, but it's I think. People are a little confused about what exactly is being accomplished or has been accomplished and what is yet that they're still trying to achieve. So there's definitely a desire to get some clarity around that. There's also the EDP Phase 2, which officially began in May of 2019. This was after the ICANN board kind of approved the initial, most of the initial um, report on Phase 1. And, you know, they were trying to take it, take it further. And really one of the big kind of things that that group worked on was um, System for Standardized Act Access and Disclosure. You'll hear it often referred to as ESAD. Um, again, ICANN loves its acronyms. Um, their initial report was published in February of 2020. There was another addendum in March, but then the final report was approved by the GNSO. That's the generic name supporting organization. Again, that bottom-up consensus policy, you know, kind of mechanism. You start with kind of work groups, and, um, and then that policy work goes up through the supporting organization that that work group is sort of constituted from. And they, um, the GNSO approved it in October. And quite honestly, a, a lot of people were, were very confused and not quite, was kind of surprised that the GNSO so quickly, well, I won't say quickly, but seem to approve it without a lot of reservations. Let's, let's do, let's say that, um, because this ESAD or this mechanism to for disclosure of who is information, most people believe what has been kind of outlined is unworkable, is cost prohibitive, that is overly complex. Um, again, not easy work. Uh, in no way saying, like, this should have been a breeze. But unfortunately, consensus is a really messy process. And um, I think even out of that group of people who worked on it, there were, you know, IP interests, business interests um, that were not so happy with what ultimately came out. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in a little bit of quicksand right now. So here I give you, you know, kind of a little bit more detail about kind of what the different industry groups are saying about, you know, the EP, EPDP um, Phase 2 final report. Um, you know, there's, there's a lack of support. Uh, I think that's probably the best way of saying it um, for, for this report. And the challenge is, is this is really important stuff. Um, how to, you know, how legitimate, people get access to who is information for legitimate reasons, for those cybersecurity investigations, for law for other law enforcement, for IP interests. Um, it is important that this system work and that we can get it up and running, you know, Probably yesterday would have been <laughs> the timing, but nonetheless, that's, you know, we, we need to get this up and running. And so, you know, what's been interesting is after this report came out and kind of this kind of general consensus that this is probably not the best way of going about this, um, ICANN has now kind of introduced some new processes um, that are going to need to happen before they approve it. In addition to, and we'll talk about this kind of new processes in, in, in a few minutes, but in addition to the new processes that are kind of being put in place, the other kind of 
thing to really notice is the GAC, so that government governmental advisory committee that I pointed out in sort of that I can't organizational slide. This is one of those, you know, advisory committees that advise the board, but you know, they've been getting plugged in earlier and earlier in the, the policy process, which I think is a really good development. That was something that kind of was an outgrowth of the the new GTLD program that launched in twenty twelve. Um, there was a real feeling that kind of Throughout, GAC, the GAC was kind of late to the table with input and recommendation. Well, really, input is mostly what they do. They kind of leave the recommendations part to, you know, how to proceed to ICANN and, and the different, um, you know, kind of policy teams. But nonetheless, um, their input was kind of viewed as late to the table. And so they've been working um, to kind of be a little bit more um, in, informed and giving input um, earlier, which I think is a really good development. But I, my kind of new barometer for how, how things are going and kind of timing of things at ICANN over the last few years has been, what is the GAC saying? Is the GAC kind of pointing out a number of problems or just maybe one or two? If they're pointing to a number of problems, that probably means it's on a really slow track, that there's a lot of things there that the governmental advisory committee really wants to see worked on. And so you can see here a pretty sizable laundry list of things that um, they'd really like for, you know, I can't to think about. You know, everything from kind of the very fragmented disclosure system that's been pro proposed to, you know, having more enforceable standards to review disclosure decisions, um, being able to better address consumer protection and consumer trust concerns, um, the overall just sort of like mechanisms for the SAD um, that's um, at, at issue, um, financial conditions that will basically, you know, potentially put a disproportionate cost for, for its use um, on users that, you know, are trying to do the right thing. So, you know, think of how many requests a cybersecurity researcher might need to make to the SAD and how if that if those costs are passed on to users to kind of get that system up up and running, um, that could be pretty sizable cost. And there you're kind of left, you know, trying to decide is it better to try to protect people and try to get you know get get to the bottom of fraud and cybercrime versus the cost of doing that. Um, also, there's you know, one of the big issues of the GAC for, again, as long as I can remember, is just the accuracy of the who is. Like, just because the who is exists, just because there's data there doesn't mean it's accurate. And there's been tons of studies throughout the time, you know, time of ICANN about the accuracy of who is. And, um, you know, that continues, the GAC, GAC continues to point to that as something, you know, that's still not fixed. And also just, you know, the status and role of each of the data controllers and processors in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the process. So um, if I were a betting lady, um, I would say this is going very slowly. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, work here still to do because the GAC has a very sizable list of concerns and none of them are super easy to address. So uh, definitely, you know, keep your eye on the GAC. So just to kind of wrap this up, there's, you know, these other overarching issues. Um, so when I talked about the kind of new processes that I can is kind of put at the end of this um, EPDP phase two um, before they're going to look at it and approve anything, um, there is this unresolved issue about the differentiation between a natural versus a legal person when it comes to registration data, data handling. So I know when I talk to, to you know many brand owners, it's you know it's been a little bit confusing why you know everything seems to be in the ICANN world one size fits all. Um, you know, companies are different than individuals, and kind of the GDPR is really about personal data protection. Um, and so there's been some confusion, or I would say at least some like kind of head scratching about, you know, a company still needs to put their who is information because it's not personal data. Um, you know, why can't 
registrars figure out how to handle that differently. Well, you know, that, that type of information differently for natural persons versus legal persons. And it really comes down to the way I can put out the temporary spec and then kind of like kept that go- has kept that going while this, these policies, processes have been going on because it's one size fits all. It's, there's no differentiation. So this is an issue that couldn't be resolved during phase two. Um, there's, they're looking at that plus the feasibility of a uniform um, anonymized registrant email address. So this is now, they're calling this new, new phase 2A. I really just call it phase three. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of like one more thing tacked on to the back of this, as well as ICANN is now launched. This isn't supposed, supposed to be just for EPDP, EPDP phase two. It's apparently something that's going to happen now with, like, all these different policies that require implementation is to have a new phase between, like, the supporting organization approving it and it being approved by the ICANN board there's going to be this operational design design phase process or review. So it's ODP, again, another acronym, um, prior to ICANN board review and approval. And basically, um, they're supposed to kind of, the, the, that review is supposed to advise the board as to the kind of cost and the time frame for implementation um, so that when they're, making a decision, they're making a more informed decision about whether or not this is something that should happen in the way it's been proposed. So this is going to get more interesting (laughs) Um, And this new phase. uh, While I I definitely think it is a, um, you know, this information is necessary to make a decision. Um, I I'm kind of scratching my head a little bit as to why it's not part of the actual PDP process, that it's actually like a second, like another phase between um, kind of it being approved from a supporting organization and before it gets approved, you know, kind of reviewed and approved by the board. So we'll kind of see how this goes. But, yeah, this is going to just elongate it further. So um, more to come. All right, so let's move on with the EPDP kind of behind us. Now let's move on to another PDP or policy development process going on. Um, It's kind of finally wrapping up is the Rights Protection Mechanism or RPM PDP. Um, Another two-phase PDP, phase one covered kind of all the new RPMs applicable in the um, first round of the new GTLD program in 2012. Phase two will focus on reviewing the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy, or the UDRP, which has been um, a rights protection mechanism that's been in place since 1999. So it's been um, with us really since uh, shortly after the inception of ICANN. So um, these, this is kind of the two phases. They are um, finished with phase one, and uh, it's, it's taken us quite some time to get there. So um, we did, just to kind of give you kind of some milestones, so in March of 2020, we got the initial report. Um, That was after a couple of kind of couple of years of review. Um, Then um, they they completed the final report in um, through August, through November of 2020. November submitted the final report to GNSO and then in January of this year, the GNSO approved the final report. Now, like we talked about the SSR2 um, report from the Security Stability and Advisory Committee, um, now that the ICANN board has this, they have six months months to review and approve um, this, this PDP um, recommendations. But I, I think with this one, this is going to probably be the least controversial or kind of, um, I think, the review basically showed that these rights protection mechanisms were, you know, were good. Um, always could be better, but still nothing like that was a complete disaster. There's some likely small incremental changes, um, but for the most part it's going to be, you know, for future rounds, the status quo. You're going to have your, you know, um, you know, the sunrise stuff, the the different um, 
you know, trademark clearinghouse, blockings, those type of things. So that's actually the block is not part of it, but the trademark clearinghouse, things like that. All that stuff will stay. Um, so it will be really um, very little uh, probably changes that will come out of this, out of this review. Now, the third PDP um, that's been kind of going on for a while is the new GTLD subsequent procedures PDP, often kind of sh in a shorthand way referred to as subpro PDP. Um, this was another review as a result of the 2012 new GTLD program, and really what they were looking at is kind of the applicant guidebook, which was sort of the, you know, the, the Bible, if you will, for how to make an application, how they'd be reviewed, how they would be, you know, added to the root server system, the contracting with the new registries, all that stuff is baked into what was called the applicant guidebook. And the subpro PDP team was really looking at all those policies and quite honestly um, some of the things that had to get figured out along the way. Um, to determine what changes might be needed. Um, ICANN had made a commitment to the GAC um, that you know, they would do a thorough review of the new GTLD program and that they would you know, review the program, identify what went right, what went wrong, and um, where there needed to be corrective action, that those corrective actions would be made. Um, there's always been some debate about whether or not everything had to be fully fixed before round two, but We'll leave that debate for another day. But this PDP had over 40 separate topics. Um, it broke into five work tracks. It was a big undertaking and, you know, something that, uh, you know, I think everybody in a lot of ways kind of under underappreciated, you know, how much work really needed to go into this kind of review. Um, it was unruly at times, but nonetheless, um, they have gone through and issued their final report. So, just you know, here's a quick rundown of you know when you know everything from when the initial report was published back in you know July of 2018 um, through you know the final report was published in August of last year. Then. Um, Sorry, the final recommendations report was published in August. The final work group published the work group published its final report in January, and in uh, February of this year, the GNSO approved the final report. Again, you know, I can have six months to review. There's still some very key issues that I think are not crystal clear, closed generics, um, mandatory and voluntary, what they call PICs or personal interest commitments that the registries make in terms of um, what they're going to um, make, uh, what, what the registry is going to do to kind of make sure that the TLD is not abused or is not used in an abusive way. Um, and then uh, how the proposed standing predictability implementation review team, which is a new team a new, and a new acronym on the scene, um, this is a team that has you know, kind of been created because there's this fear as like we're going through implementation again that there'll be new questions. And, you know, one of the challenges was last time with the kind of the um, once, app, one pe once people applied, kind of issues kind of kept on popping up as, uh, you know, like how ICANN would review the applications and, you know, like issues like closed generics and singular versus plural strings and, things like that, and, you know, the GAC was kind of weighing, trying to weigh in in real time, but oftentimes they couldn't meet the time, time frames, and so there's this new, you know, standing predictability implementation review team that's supposed to try to help with this, but now the GAC is kind of scratching their head thinking, um, so how do we fit into that? Because we still need to provide our input and our advice to the board. So that's going to be a sticky, um, sticky issue. So um, the good news is, though, there is a likely major victory for brand owners in what's coming out of the, the subpro PDP, and that's really some new mandatory personal interest com um, commitment where the registry operate, operator will not engage in fraudulent or deceptive practices. So, you know, many of you will kind of look, you know, who were involved in, you know, 
registrations during the, the kind of the height of the new GTLD program in like 2014, 2015, a little bit of 2016, and somewhat ongoing still, there were some registries that, you know, like some of this, um, the way they handled kind of um, premium reserve names, um, some of the ways that they, you know, kind of handled, you know, who could register, like the Sunrise registration was really expensive, but then you got to general availability and it was super cheap and they were kind of threatening, um, you know, that, you know, brand owners could, you know, there could be uh, these these general availability registrations could be, you know, in a way uh, causing a lot of issues for brand owners. Like the TLD that comes to mind is, is DOP feedback was a really big issue um, during the new GTLD program. But these new personal interest commitments where the registry operator um, states they will not engage in fraudulent or deceptive practices this is something seen as, you know, something that will give brand owners some enforceability, something to go after in situations like that. There wasn't anything like that in the contracts. These these picks are in the contracts, and there weren't in the uh, – this type of stuff wasn't in the contracts for um, the round one new GTLDs, and it really kind of left um, brand owners feeling, like, extorted and often, um, you know, that – the bad guys were sometimes the ones who were winning. So I, I'm, I'm really um, hopeful that this does uh, kind of change the dynamic a little bit. So if all that wasn't enough, <laughs> there's a couple of other um, PDP updates to provide. So one is a new PDP on the scene, which is um, the transfer PDP. This is a new two-phased um, PDP that um, on the transfer policy was uh, announced on Feb in February, February 18th. And this PDP will review the policy governing transfers of domain names from one registrar to another. And this is really when the, the whole temporary specification went into effect um, in, in response to the enforceability of the GDPR in May of 2018, you know, there was a lot of information that became redacted in the who is. And some of that information, particularly like the admin email address, is really important information in the transfer process that is used to send different kind of notices um, to the, the, the kind of, tr you know, different part, you know, the, the current owner of the domain name. So it kind of broke the transfer process a bit. And so, um, you know, that kind of form of authorization, that was the notice that was sent, was, is really something that's been part of the transfer process for quite some time. And when it was implemented, it was really meant to kind of make sure that these kind of unauthorized transfers weren't happening, that the current registrant was getting kind of an opportunity to say no. And, you know, now we're effectively, for a transfer, you need to make a request to a registrar and provide them an off, an authorization code, often referred to as an off code. And there's no ever talking to the registrant and of the current, you know, the current registrant. So this has broken the transfer process. It's put, it's taken out an important kind of safeguard. And so that's why this PDP, there's kind of a list of several PDPs that need to be launched kind of in light of um, what's happened with the GDPR and, you know, a lot of it also hinges on the outcome of some of these EPDP um, phases. But nonetheless, uh, the transfer one can, you know, we can go back and we can look at the transfer policies and see what can happen here. So that's a new PDP, um, just getting started, not a lot to report there yet. And then kind of bringing back an old PDP, <laughs> um, some of you will remember the privacy and proxy PDP um, that was was uh, just coming to the train station, quite honestly. It finally wrapped up in 2018, you know, like late 2017, early, yeah, late, late, late 2017, and was starting towards the implementation phase, um, started the implementation phase in 2018, but that train stopped. Um, because of this GDPR stuff. And initially it was a temporary stop, and then it was more than temporary. 
and there's been a lot of brand owners particularly kind of saying, hey, wait a minute, why can't we just continue to move forward? You know, ICANN's been pushing back saying, look, you know, it's really important to see how this EPDP stuff comes out. You know, these things are, are tightly coupled. We need to work this out. But a lot of a lot of the community, myself included, feels like we really need to wrap up this privacy and proxy PDP. Let's get this implemented. And then much like transfers, if we need to go back and we need to do some tweaks in light of sort of how the whole EPDP stuff works out, then that's what we should do. But, you know, privacy and proxy, that's where, you know, you have, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see like, a, you know, the name of another company, a privacy service or something like that, or you'll see somebody else listed as a proxy for a registrant. The challenge is, is ICANN currently does not have any kind of contractual relationship with that privacy or proxy provider. And the registrar that holds the registration, while they may be kind of the operator of that privacy and proxy service, maybe through another company that they own, um, they are currently not being held accountable for the, the privacy or proxy provider's um, kind of wrongdoing and not um, providing, you know, kind of causing um, notification of complaints and um, responding to complaints. So, you know, the, the privacy and proxy PDP really tried to get at trying to fix that, and the implementation is something that many are, are waiting on. So ICANN did promise during ICANN 70 that that would resume soon, but they haven't given a specific date. So more to come on that, but um, I think they have held off the masses for long enough, and I think that this is going to um, reopen that, that work stream again. All right, now that we've completed our discussion on key PDP updates. I just want to come back to the GAC. I mentioned uh, the GAC throughout, but I want to just come back to them quickly. Um, so just so you get a sense, the Governmental Advisory uh, Committee is now made up of about 178 countries and territories. Um, there's 38 observer organizations and approximately 500 participants or delegates from the GAC. This engagement has really increased um, throughout the kind of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you see here there's been 60 new delegates since ICANN 66. So in four meetings, there's really been a huge increase, biggest increase we've seen in the short of time um, uh, with the GAC, and really an increased demand for engagement about the virtual environment. And so it's clear that governments are really focusing on the internet and sort of how the internet affects the information, the commerce, et cetera, that occurs within their borders and with their residents. So at the end of every ICANN meeting, um, the GAC always issues what they call the GAC communique. And the GAC will, um, you know, give their advice and also in their communique will kind of highlight some issues that they have concerns about or things that they did at the meeting that they want the, the general public to be really clear about, either their position or what they would like to see done. So um, one thing the GAC has really kind of put an emphasis on this meeting is that they really want the ICANN board to address the public policy concerns outlined in the GAC minority statement um, to the final report of the Phase two EPDP. So this is the very specific advice. And advice, you know, is a special word when it comes to the GAC because that's their kind of mandate to give advice to the ICANN board. And when they do, the ICANN board is, is kind of required to look at that and then say, okay, we either agree, we reject, or maybe we have some other questions, you know, we need some clarification. But if they reject and the GAC disagrees, that can kind of create a whole other process based on some rules in the ICANN bylaws. We saw that kind of play out when the new GTLD program was launched. But, 
you know, here are some, you know, I mentioned earlier um, kind of the public policy the concerns they um, are worried about in the phase two of um, the EPDP, but basically they are saying to the board, look, you need to do further work on this, and the board, the ICANN board, should assess now how to best address them. Um, like I said, the GAC gives advice. They typically don't give recommendations. They just tell you, go work on this. They don't go tell you what to do. So um, we'll see, but this was some very strong advice that the GAC um, kind of reiterated their comments, um, public policy comments um, from the EPDP Phase 2 report. So as I said once before during this presentation, keep your eyes on the GAC. You know, their issues of concern continue to grow, DNS abuse, PICs, RPMs, subsequent procedures, EPDP. Their power and leverage continues to evolve. They're growing. They no longer sit on the sidelines. They really are trying to get like, provide some feedback, some guidance, some inputs. Um, earlier in the process, they've really embedded representatives and key work streams and policy discussions. So do not underestimate their power and their leverage. And at the, end of day, at the end of the day, they have proven themselves to be a check. Um, they see the kind of desire for ICANN and the contracted parties to move fast and to kind of like just operate as business as usual with minor tweaks along the edges. The GAC is not going to let that happen. They are really pushing and pulling um, to make sure that things get addressed and not swept under the rug. So while I recognize we've gone probably a couple of minutes long here, I would not be right if I didn't end this presentation with timing on round two because after every one of these webinars, I always get asked this question, when is round two going to happen? So I think you can tell from this presentation that ICANN has to overcome the skepticism of the GAC. Some voices are getting light, louder about like DNS abuse and the lack of agreed solution on registration data. Subsequent procedures still has a number of policy and implementation, what I call landmines. Um, I know that there's a lot of consultants out there buzzing, saying, oh, it's going to happen in 2022. Oh, you know, all this policy work is done. I'm here to tell you, no, that is not the case. Um, I would be surprised if it happens in 2023, but if it does, it would be at the very end of 2023. I think it's likely beyond that. So. Um, we'll see. Um, what I'm reading right now is that we've got a little bit ways to still go, and there's some key issues in the ICANN world that have to be resolved before all these additional TLDs get introduced. And quite honestly, during this meeting, I heard the GAC say if there needs to be a ne next round or if there should be another round. Um, very deliberate very deliberate that language. They are really pushing ICANN to, to assess whether or not an additional round of TLDs is really needed now. So um, more to come. As again, as again, as I said earlier, keep your eyes on the GAC. So with that, I'll turn that over to you, Tarek, and uh, thanks everybody for your time today. Thanks, Gretchen. That was a great presentation. And that's all the time that we have today. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, and we hope to see you next time.